and record. Hello, welcome to Usable Angst. This is a webinar that is part of the World Usability Day speaker series. I'm Elizabeth Rosenzweig, founder and director of World Usability Day. We're going to be talking about the futures of com community police interaction. Next, please. Next. Oh. I am, I'm joined today um, by two colleagues, Yo Dispendi, uh, design researcher and experience strategist, and Madebo Fatunde, foresight strategist and writer. Next, please. Today, we're going to talk about several things. I'm going to start off by talking about body worn cameras, BWCs, talk about some projects I worked on. Uh, and then um, Yo will be talking about cultural issues that inhibit the use of body worn cameras. And um, Madeba will be talking about trends and signals of community police relations. And then we'll also be talking about some solutions. And this is a lead up for a workshop that we've done several times. So we'll talk about that a little bit and then we'll talk about our next steps. Next, please. I'm going to start by talking about body worn cameras. I worked on body worn cameras for uh, over a year and have a lot of uh, collected a lot of data and have a lot to a lot of insights to share. Next, please. So let's step back for a minute and think about social media and think about how lots of information and images are thrown in front of us uh, when we log on. Here's an example of a simple search I did uh, looking at um, body-worn cameras and police. And I know there are some possibly triggering images that show up. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's important for us to note because what's happening is we have certainly have a rise of citizens recording um, their own videos because we all have cameras. We're walking around with us all the time. And that is making it even more crucial uh, that the cameras on the other side, the body-worn cameras are also recording so that we get lots of, we get different uh, pieces of information um, in order to understand what's really happening when we look at some of these interactions between police and the community. So let's think about body-worn cameras for a minute. So most of them are worn somewhere on the chest. They mount on a uniform. There's a few that go on glasses, but for the most part, most um, police agencies have cameras on the body. Okay, so they mount on the uniform or, or they have a special holder uh, to go pretty much in the front of the body. Um, and there's a few pictures here to show you that. The way it works is that the, when the cameras aren't being used, they are sitting in a dock and you can see that on this picture. The dock does several things. Uh, it recharges the batteries, it downloads all the videos, clears the cache. So what happens is each shift, the officer comes in, takes their camera off the dock, puts it on their body, and then a new fresh day of recording starts. What happens the way that the cameras technically work is that they're actually recording all the time, but it's, not, it's, it's only recording in a buffer. The cameras are usually um, programmed to hold about two minutes of buffer at any given time, but agencies can decide whether it's two minutes or one minute or 30 seconds. The buffer is sort of the memory that keeps recording as we go, but what happens is it isn't saved until a record button is pushed. If the record button is pushed on the body worn camera, then it will go back and start saving from whenever the buffer was. So let's say the buffer is two minutes, if an officer pushes the button, the record button, then the, the recording actually will start two minutes prior, right? And so that gives the buffer time, um, you know, to sort of give a big picture. Um, and then at the end, the videos all go into the cloud. I, I just wanna point out one thing that I'll come back to later. If you're an officer and let's say you just started your shift or let's say you were on a break two minutes ago, possibly in the bathroom or talking about something personal on the phone, 
it might be difficult just as a human being, you may feel a little privacy issue if the recording is going to go back and still capture you in the bathroom, right? So, so there is a piece of human factors here that's important to understand as we move forward and look at the cameras. Okay, next. So the body-worn camera industry is huge and getting bigger all the time. It's important also to understand that as we think about how it's being used and how it's going to be rolled out in the world. You can see uh, from the, the picture uh, how worldwide this is um, and that the market only five years from now will be projected to about 1.5 billion. Here's a list of some of the leading manufacturers you can see. Um, and they're pretty much in any region around the world. Next, please. So I'm gonna talk for a few more minutes about my, per, my experience doing a year long study on body worn cameras, next. So I was working with one of the leading manufacturers and uh, as a consultant, I was hired to do a, a pretty much 360 view of the cameras and then uh, make design recommendations to improve them. So my team did an expert review on the current situation of body worn cameras uh, and then we did a baseline usability test of a current market uh, at the time, uh, a current camera that was in use. And then we did so that we did that in the lab, had the officers bring their cameras in, show them how they show us how they use them, where they put them on their bodies. And then we did um, field studies that included ride alongs. Uh, and so I went on several ride alongs um, with officers who had cameras. Uh, then also did 25 interviews in two cities of police officers using cameras. And again, we, what, the interviews included um, the use of a, of a new prototype that we had developed. The officers brought their gear in and we wanted to see how they put it on their, their uniform. Uh, and then we asked them to talk about their experiences and to describe a challenging day and how the body worn cameras impacted the, the challenge. As I said, we were looking at a 3D um, prototype. We also did testing of um, icons that were on the displays. So it was a real, a real thorough study. Next, please. Now, what we we were looking at human factors, and there was quite quite a lot of um, consideration. So one thing is cognitive overload. For those who are not familiar with the term. Cognitive overload is, is what's happening in your mind, if, in your brain, basically, in your cognitive processing as you're trying to do activities, as you're trying to do tasks. What happens for an officer is that they are in usually, uh, or, or sometimes, high-risk situations, which, which increases um, their uh, cognitive overload. So the general theory of cognitive overload is that any human can hold seven plus or minus two things in their head at any time. That means even the most, um, you know, the best multitasker among us could do nine things. Um, but if you're under stress or you're uh, in some sort of heightened emotional state, you're gonna be dropping down to the minus two, not the plus two. So you could end up with only being able to hold five things in your head. Why is that important? These officers have at least 12 things on their body at any given time. They've got um, weapons, they've got uh, first aid kits, they've got handcuffs, they've got, you know, uh, communication devices. So having the camera there, it's just one more thing to forget, basically. Um, and the other thing is, is that sometimes if they're, you know, in some sort of hazardous situation, they're going to be thinking more about the environment and not about everything that they're wearing especially if they're at risk. Some of the cameras, uh, the original ones we looked at, weren't always designed uh, with the user of the officer in mind. And some of them, even when they were recording, had, had big red circles so that the officers felt like they were a target in the dark, um, among other things. Uh, they also sometimes would have cognitive overload, as I mentioned. Um, sometimes they would forget to turn the camera on because they were doing all the other things they had to do to get started with their day. Um, so there's a lot to keep in mind as we, as we look at these cameras. Next, please. So we learned quite a bit from the interviews. Um, and what happened is 
that the officers, both in Seattle and Boston, when I was when I was talking with them, had some very very interesting stories to tell. Um, in Boston, uh, there was uh, one one officer particular stood out, and um, he was uh, a black officer who had actually worked in the New York Police Department, moved to Boston, worked in the um, Boston Police Department. His whole family had been police officers. He was very very dedicated and. When um, I asked him to describe his experience, the first thing he said to me was he felt like he was the safety blanket that the rest of us sleep under every night. And it, it was an interesting sentiment because I hadn't really thought of it that way. Then he went on to describe his experience in Boston. So for those of you who may not have been watching Boston News, I'll tell you that there was the Boston Marathon bombing was the first difficult uh, experience that we, we had. And he was talking about being there uh, and and what it was like uh, to respond. And he was at both, he was in between, two bombs went off, he was in between. Uh, and the description of the officers coming together and and what, what their focus was, was basically to save lives, uh, was pretty moving. And then he went on to describe two other experiences, which I believe put put the officers in Boston in in a, in a probably difficult, un, unpredicted experience. The first one was the Women's March. That one they did have uh, about a hundred cameras. The Boston police officers were uh, testing out um, the Women's March in 2017 in January. It was anticipated to have about between 75,000 and 100,000 people in the Boston Common, and instead 175,000 people turned out. So at a certain point, the crowd control became quite difficult. And the description of what the officer's experiences were there and just trying to provide a safe environment was a bit of an eye opener. But the last story was the most powerful. In 27, uh, that, that, that summer, August 2017, Boston had um, a free speech rally organized, which was a white nationalist group. 100 people signed up to come to the free speech rally. They had a permit, um, but what happened that day was um, 40,000 Bostonians who did not have a permit marched on Boston Common. And the police officers, their assignment was to protect the free speech, right? Uh, whether they agreed politically with them or not. But what happened is they basically were working with the 40,000 protesters who had no, <laughs> <laughs> had no permit um, to peacefully protest and and then disperse without having to arrest anyone. Um, and it went pretty well for a while until uh, stories started to emerge that at one corner of Boston Common, uh, there were protesters who were throwing bottles of um, urine at the police and then tweeting about the police arresting them. So that that I haven't seen the footage of on the side, on either side, but the anecdotal um, stories gave me a bit of pause to think, how do we actually know what's happening, right? We want to know, but we don't always get all the information. This was very clear when I talked to Seattle, Seattle police officers. Seattle is a very hilly city. For people who haven't been there, you know, you could be like, like hills like this, right? Think about being a police officer on a bike, going up a hill, okay? You're, you're holding on going up a hill, chasing somebody, you're, you're most likely not going to be able to take your hand off and push the button to record. And that's a problem. That's a problem because you want to get the footage. So, so in both these situations, um, the technology is not making it completely easy for officers to be able to record. And at the same time, we're getting a lot of citizens recordings that are not always telling the entire story. So ideally a good solution, I'm already, you know, is to, to be able to put all the, all the recordings together. From the officer's point of view, the big takeaway was for the most part, officers who had the cameras and the ones who talked to me uh, felt that the, the cameras actually did help establish trust because they could um, provide uh, data videos to show the public that the officers were, like these stories in Boston, trying to actually help keep the peace. Granted, it's not true in every case, granted. And there are some officers who may not turn their cameras on 
for other reasons. But for the most part, the officers who were using them felt that they helped um, create trust with the public, but the concern was privacy. Again, the two minute buffer going back, if they're in the bathroom, what if they're complaining about their wife on the phone to somebody else or just to their partner? And you know, I know some people may say, well, they're officers and when they're on, on duty, they have no privacy. And, and that's a point of view we need to consider. But human factors and the rights of people on both sides is very important, especially when we're looking at body-worn cameras. Next. So to, to wrap up the, the body-worn cameras um, technical discussion, I think there's ways of designing the cameras to avoid cognitive overload. They could have more intelligence to turn off, to turn on, to turn on the recording, maybe voice commands so that the officers don't have to remember to push the button, make them simpler. And a lot of these companies are doing that, making the user experience more memorable, making it easy to do the different functions, put it in stealth mode, the kinds of things that the officers want, um, and then to think about the officer's safety. Next. And I'm turning it over to Yo to talk about the cultural issues. Thanks. Well, thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you for creating the space of this workshop and for using uh, World Usability Day to amplify these messages and these voices too. And thank you, Medevo, for creating in this space too and drawing out the systems in it. Um, I'm Yo Deshpande. And so I'll talk a bit, a bit about these cultural issues going on with body worn cameras here. So uh, Elizabeth has begun to talk about usability and the human factors aspects here. And in the usable angst part, I'll be going a bit more into the angst. Um, we can go on to the next slide. So the angst being these kind of wider high level issues that are going on that are essentially preventing body worn cameras from being successful on a cultural and societal level um, and that are inhibiting usability on uh, not just the technical side, but on a, a personal and interpersonal side. So the case of Daniel Prude draws this out. Daniel Prude was a 41 year old black man who visited his brother in Rochester, New York this past March. Daniel had a history of substance abuse um, to one night there were some sort of issues that were going on. Um, others said that he was, he was outside, you know, running around naked. Police were called, uh, an arrest was made. The arrest grew violent, though it seemed like Prude uh, wasn't resisting as much. The methods used were um, more violent to apprehend Prude. He ends up being pinned, um, uh, asphyxiated and dies in the hospital several days later. Now, the interesting aspect of this tragic situation was that all of the officers who were uh, participating in Prude's arrest had on body-worn cameras. They were all recording the event. And the Dana Prude's family is trying to get the footage from the Rochester Police Department. The, the police department won't release it though. And their thinking in not releasing it is that they want to prevent protests like the protests after George Floyd's killing. They're trying to keep some sort of peace in Rochester. And to that end, they take uh, a series of sort of labyrinthine bureaucratic methods to prevent the sharing of this body-worn camera footage. The family submits open records requests, the lawyers are pushing for it. Eventually, after a, several months, uh, documents are released showing how the police willfully obstructed the body more camera footage from being shared. And because of this, ultimately protests start in Rochester. Civilians are clashing with the police, just the situation that the police department was trying to avoid. And finally, the footage is released to the family. Daniel Prude's family finds out what happened in his death. Go on to the next slide. So this unfortunately is not an uncommon situation. There are a lot of usability issues taking this wider definition of usability for all the parties that are involved. And for law enforcement, the central issues are around 
dealing with a lack of funding primarily. Their first priority is to provide fair salaries and support services to their employees and to maintain equipment that's protecting officer safety. They're less concerned secondarily or, or on tertiary level concerned about adopting the new technology that's more externally focused. Then the new technology itself can make uh, officers and people in police in, in on law enforcement in general feel uncomfortable, like it's not the sort of policing they signed up for. And Elizabeth was, was talking about some of these issues going on. Beyond that, there's also departmental infighting that can happen around these personal issues. So officers disagreeing with the use of body-worn cameras, willfully choosing not to turn on theirs in certain cases. Um, and even if they're instructed by say commanding officers, there can still be this personal level resistance against officers using this. Um, and so this can you know, lead to a whole nother can of worms about uh, you know, police unions and different sorts of levels of accountability going on across departments. But centrally there are these personal issues around people using the body more cameras effectively. We can go on to the next slide. For citizens, the issues aren't around adoption like they are for law enforcement, but around understanding and access. So in order to support body-worn cameras, communities have to understand what they are, essentially, how they work, that they're in use, what the current rules are for their local law enforcement agencies around using them, or around having them on. And there hasn't been any, or, you know, there haven't been public messaging campaigns that really share this kind of information with civilians at large or inform civilians of their rights that pertain to body-worn cameras. There aren't any uh, widespread pamphlets about filing open records requests in these situations or asking officers to confirm that their body-worn cameras are on. Then there are these issues that body-worn cameras are a new technology, right? There's not much legislation that can be enforced around them like we saw in the Daniel Crude case, a civilian family can file for an open records request, but then there's umpteen ways in which it can be delayed, delayed or avoided. And there's little legal recourse as it stands right now to address this. There's just not a legal precedent because it's a new technology for a set timeline even for body worn camera footage to be released. Um, in the case of George Floyd's killing, it was bystander uh, phone footage that was immediately and widely circulated. Uh, the officers involved were using body worn cameras, but that footage wasn't shared until weeks after a Minnesota Hennepin County judge ordered the release of that footage in mid August. And George Floyd was killed at, at the end of May. Um, so, and it was the judge that forced the footage release. That's important to note too. The department was uh, had not released it in that time. And uh, there's the case of the, the Civilian Review Board in New York, which is valuable to think about too, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, where they filed requests for body more camera footage, uh, you know, for a suspect who was being tried in a, in a case. The police department, New York Police Department, acknowledged that the officers in question in the case had body more cameras on and that there was footage that they had but denied sharing that footage with the review board for an entire year. So at a certain point, someone leaked the footage to the press, to the New York Post, I think, and then it was released to the Civilian Review Board. So the Civilian Review Board has shared, uh, has struck a deal with the police department where the police department promises to provide footage within 25 days. And after a year, there are more and more cases like this where the Civilian Review Board has received like 1,100 complaints, 40% of these are more than 90 days old. And the board is outraged, but they don't have anything based on legal action that they can really do to, uh, to move things forward with the police department. So this is obviously technically frustrating, but it's also terrible emotionally for a lot of reasons. You know, there's, you can imagine being a grieving family trying to get closure and you wanna know how your child died. And you wanna know what happened, you want justice to be carried out and to be able to grieve 
and the situation could just be halted and extended for a year, years. Um, and of course, this isn't just in New York. This is happening in cities across the US and across the world in different police departments because of the, the cultural usability aspects of this new body-worn camera technology. And I just want to mention here that for law enforcement, this means that body-worn cameras aren't doing them any good when they're not being effectively used and footage isn't opened up to access for the public. Body-worn cameras aren't helping, the footage from body-worn cameras isn't helping officers uh, serve their communities and do them good because communities can't then see the footage of officers who are doing wonderful work in communities, who are uplifting their communities. And they can't support those officers or point to that sort of policing as the kind of policing that they want. So it basically renders all the positive aspects of body-worn cameras null as well. So we can go on to the next slide. So we're talking about the, uh, the users here, and we're talking about civilians and law enforcement and the wider community that's sort of the combination of the two. We're using a few different words to re refer to these different groups. So I refer to civilians or citizens. Um, and as one police captain who we spoke with emphasized, the divisions are kind of false here in that uh, law enforcement are members of the community, they're citizens, right? I, I just said in the same way that civilians who aren't involved in law enforcement are part of the community. But that exact division that we feel and that we all kind of resonate with um, in hearing it is just the issue that we're drawing out here. That part of what's developed is a, a gap that feels uh, difficult to break through and to close based off who the kind of users, who has the power and the access around body-worn cameras. So as we move into design solutions later on in, uh, in workshops, we'll be thinking about how to deal with these issues and how to specifically address these different user groups. So in order to design for users, we'll be thinking about these, these different issues as we move on. And it's important to understand not just what's going on on the top level of culture, but what's happening on the deeper levels and the wider, uh, the wider channels around society going on of how technology is advancing and how people are responding to it across these different user groups. So to draw out those deeper issues, I'll pass it off to Medevo to talk about trends and signals. Thank you, Yo. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so in engaging in a dialogue about trends and signals around community and police relations. Let's first do some level setting. Um, so the language of trends and signals comes from a discipline called foresight, which is uh, the one I'm trained in. And this is uh, simply put an academic uh, discipline for long-term futures thinking and thinking critically about the futures. Uh, and we've got six basic pillars. You'll find different iterations of this, but essentially framing which is uh, sort of scoping out and setting the boundaries of, of, uh, of an exploration into a future. Scanning, which is looking for uh, both inbound and outbound sources of change. Uh, then there's futuring or forecasting, which is actually uh, fleshing out those futures that you may have foreseen. Uh, visioning, which is committing to a preferred future and defining sort of the parameters of what sort of future you want to create. Then there is designing, which is uh, often planning backwards and, um, and developing artifacts of that future you want to create and, how you, and sort of your steps to get there. And then adapting, which is uh, sort of reorganizing yourself around that future so that you become the sort of organization or individual who, um, who can take those steps to get there. So uh, trends and signals are most closely related to scanning. And uh, the reason we're talking about this here is because we are interested most uh, keenly in what is changing about community and police relations. Um, and so briefly, I wanna illustrate some of the differences between a trend and a signal. A trend is uh, probably what we're all most familiar with, which is what's buzzy, 
Um, and uh, that's a sort of a glib way of saying that a trend is a summary of historical data, right? It is a trend of no matter how good your data is, it is an obsolete snapshot of what was happening up to a moment from now. Signals, on the other hand, give you a little bit more lead time because they are so uh, they are so faint a suggestion of a future um, that you you can't really get great data for them, but um, you can probably extrapolate from them a way that the future may turn out differently. And the most likely outcome of any signal is that it may come out to nothing. And so a big part of, uh, of getting into futures of being able to see more futures and evaluate them is learning to relax your critical faculty in terms of, uh, in terms of sort of the, uh, the outcome of it and letting go so much of the outcome and getting more in love with the process of expanding that kind of possibility. So uh, if we're thinking about the theme of plant-based plant proteins, uh, back, in the, <laughs> back in the 60s, uh, this gentleman on the left may have been quite a good signal uh, for the advent of, in you know, the popular, popularity of plant-based proteins today in common discourse. Whereas over here on the right uh, in 2020, when David Asprey, a tech CEO, is uh, sort of introducing his plan to live as close to forever as he can. Um, and plant-based proteins are a big part of that. Um, it's more trendy today. Um, still somewhat niche, but, um, but very much more visible than it was before. In virtual personalities, uh, an early signal of this uh, might, might have been Twitter, Twitter bots. Um, and you know the you know early social media. Um, however, today when we have a uh, huge talent agency signing an entirely digital, uh, a tiny virtual influencer, um, that's more of a trend. And for touch interfaces, uh, this device over here, some of you may recognize, is the Magic Link, which had almost every innovation of the iPhone. Um, outside of, you know, a color screen. <laughs> um, and that, you know, which was developed back in the 80s, uh, was, was some very early signal for the advent of touch, of touch interfaces. Whereas the iPhone, by the time it came out, um, launched a huge trend uh, for touch interfaces. So part of what brings us to this talk and what, you know, developed the idea space for this talk is the ways in which the the fuel on which uh, on which our law enforcement acts, which is uh, some form of legitimacy, right? Um, the idea that the power that is vested in them is legitimately vested, and that they are careful custodians of that legitimacy, um, is in crisis. And if we think about this uh, from a few different levels, we think about um, the out sort of the inbound sources of change coming from the global environment. We see. Um, lots of questioning of power structures and power relations. Uh, one might, uh, you know, cite, you know, America's international standing as one of those sort of places of uncertainty and instability. Um, and more locally, uh, we've been experiencing this year quite a bit of social unrest around, uh, around police brutality and the happening of police hurting citizens. Um, and then more internally, there's a destabilization of the code, uh, there's a destabilization of the legitimacy and sort of the honor, right, of the shield itself, of, um, of the sort of the dignity and the labor of policing. Uh, one uh, foresight tool, which uh, we won't dig too deep into today, but that I think is very useful for excavating um, sort of the deep structures of what we're uh, of what we're experiencing now is causal layered analysis, and this um, sort of is is commonly uh, taken by the image of the iceberg. And the idea is that there is, of course, what you hear at the surface, and that's the litany. These are the news of the world. Um, if you just take them at face value, these are the sound bites, the headlines. If you're somebody who's reading the news, these are things that you're very aware of at a surface level, and if we want to dip deeper down the stack into uh, first the causes and systems that um, provide, that generate, sorry, this litany of happenings, um, that these are your best possible explanations of, uh, and you know, given the evidentiary rules of our society right now, 
um, this is our best explanation for how this is happening. So if you think about, say, a Vox Explainer article um, that's digging into sort of potential causes of, you know, uh, of police brutality and, and sort of these uh, these killings um, or and or say, you know, a New York Times expose about, you know, the mechanics of a particular case uh, you're at that causes and systems level. If we dip even deeper down into the worldviews, um, these are the scenarios and habits of mind that allow us to accept the exp explanations above and perhaps even um, the people who enact uh, these actions to, uh, to partake in them. And then if we get even deeper down um, into the mythic level, these are the deepest and most unquestioned stories about who we are essentially, not just about why we do what we do, but about who we are, about how our society is, is constructed. Um, and they're so invisible to us in normal operation because they are so deep. So uh, some replicated structures of, and, and some ways in which the, uh, the police and say body work cameras and, uh, and different solutions we have to society's problems uh, echo one another in structure um, are as follows. Uh, one, uh, they're predicated on some idea that we can fundamentally be disentangled. Within the statement community police relations, there is some idea that the police can be removed from the community. And, and it's from that position that they then act on the community, which is false. There's a false binary. At the end of the day, police are part of your community. Um, and this is part of why it's so divisive when they wind up hurting somebody with a citizen within the community. Um, from this fissure, we get, you know, these two different identities, right, of law enforcement versus citizen, um, which should not be separate, however, are um, based off of the structures that we've developed around them. Then we have <laughs> amplifying these divisions, technology, right, which is amplifying not just these divisions, but every division in society. Um, but the way we've set up our technology stack, and specifically when we're talking about how we receive information, information technology especially, has been amplifying these divisions of power all the way down into our psyches. Um, we've been talking a lot about why, you know, how we're more polarized today than we, have, than we have been before, about how it's more difficult to get the norms and other things that made our society work previously to operate because of this sort of shrill... Uh, you know, political argumentation style we've developed over the internet. Um, we can see that within that solution is some of that same division. Um, and then we have the crisis of labor, right? We've built um, in at least the United States, our ideas of things around uh, around the Protestant work ethic, around your, your, your job being a source of identity. And for everybody, uh, these things are being questioned right now and from you know the space of the pandemic and i think especially for law enforcement these things uh, have been disrupted by the presence of uh, cameras everywhere and and sort of this public reaction to what they see uh, and a point that i, I really want to make strongly here is as the idea that not only are these solutions common in structure um, we, we're also thinking about the police as a solution that's being proposed to perhaps too many of, uh, of society's problems and that this is part of the structural problem in the same way that, say, a camera being proposed as a solution um, is perhaps being oversubscribed to and, and probably insufficient when it comes to uh, community police relations. And so very quickly, I wanna gloss over a few signals and trends and, and sort of these uh, signs of change, as I discussed earlier, about what we're experiencing in community police relations um, and, and further on. Um, so socially, the spatial trauma of people living through the pandemic, being confined in space, um, is also, I think the the changing reaction, right, to an exposed human face at all, right, is something that um, is is really redefining the politics of how we move and how we experience one another. Um, we're seeing, uh, in, in part, because of this uh, this confinement, the rise in domestic crimes. Uh, we've also 
been projected to have, you know, an enormous wave of dehousings and, um, and sorry, evictions uh, coming on as a result of people's loss of work during, uh, during the pandemic. We're also experiencing people losing their work-based identity as they're losing their work. Um, and we also, you know, discussed a little bit earlier how that might also be active for police. Um, technologically, we're seeing things accelerated uh, by the pandemic um, and responses to the pandemic and hopefully solutions to the pandemic. But um, many of these things are being accelerated, such as, uh, you know, big data, surveillance cap capitalism, predictive analytics and facial recognition, um, which can be particularly, uh, which, as we discussed, can, uh, can exacerbate the splits that we're seeing. Um, especially in policing. Ecologically, uh, we are still experiencing the effects of climate change and, um, and perhaps worsening them. We're seeing more volatile weather systems. We are seeing that how these weather systems can compound the effects of the pandemic and how they might, you know, in the future, release further pandemics. Um, and we're also seeing a really slow pace of travel, which has relaxed some of the pressure um, some of the pressures we were putting on our environment with all the car carbon we were spitting out. Economically, uh, we're seeing the continued, uh, sort of the continued trend of zero marginal cost economics, um, as you know, Andreas and Horowitz uh, puts it, software eating the world. Uh, we are seeing housing markets in flux. We're seeing an increase in income inequality. Um, and we're seeing monetary policy and extremists. The government has done uh, some magical things nobody knew it could do, or we had perhaps forgotten it was able to do um, because of the extreme situation we're in. And this has opened up some space for political imagination. Um, we're seeing uh, COVID responses and the difference in, uh, in COVID recoveries really affecting how people see their governments. And once again, that legitimacy, that legitimacy crisis we're seeing internationally. We're seeing an increase in polarization, um, shifting regulatory regimes and, uh, and some experiments in governance structures. So one example of a signal, um, and this is you know part of the uh, part of the madness and part of the uh, genius of signals is that they're indeterminate. So if we take a look at just the Aurora Colorado Police Department, um, on August 24th, 2019, Elijah McClain was killed. This has, if you've been paying any attention at all, um, became a rallying cry in the summer of 2020, um, along with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and other people who had unfortunately fallen, uh, fallen victim to the abuses of police. Um, and, uh, and Wilson at the time was an interim uh, police chief at the, at the Aurora Police Department. And by and large, um, her response was not well received um, in, in, uh, in the Eliza McLean case. Um, and uh, quite famously, a few of her officers were at the funeral of Elijah, Elijah McLean reenacting the chokehold used to kill him. Um, it wasn't a good look. Uh, she did some cleanup, uh, but it wasn't necessarily well received. Uh, if we think three days later in a completely different media cycle, um, Shatian Kelly, who was a woman who was arrested, uh, driven about 20 minutes down the road um, by an officer, hogtied like this, fell on her head and spent the entire car ride begging the officer, please, can you let me up? Um, and those pleas eventually devolved into her asking, uh, begging, master, please, I'll be good. Um, and Wilson's response uh, was pretty on the mark. Uh, if we're uh, if we're you know just evaluating these claims differently, um, she rejected a community review board suggestion that the cop get sus get paid suspension um, and just fired him outright. Um, and she you know made an enormous apology to Miss Kelly, um, who survived gratefully. So this is another, you know, factor in how that was received. Um, and one might look at, you know, Vanessa Wilson, who was one of 12 police chiefs in our 54 largest police department, 12 female police chiefs in our 54 largest police departments. And she might be, a, and these two, uh, sorry, and these two, and these two uh, situations might be 
vastly different, differently read as signals. So Wilson herself might be read as some sort of signal towards uh, the deculturing of sort of masculine police culture. Um, she might also be a signal for just far better PR for police, uh, for police departments and sort of a, an improving understanding of how the, the conversation around these things is shifting. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody gets better at this. And back to you for how we design some solutions to these problems. Great. Thanks, Madeo. Yeah, so in thinking about how these, what these signals could be suggesting moving forward, we'll be moving into this designing solution space. Now we've covered the human factors kind of micro and macro from the technical issues that are plaguing body-worn cameras in particular to the cultural technical issues, you know, going on between communities and in community police relationships and the societal signals and trends that are affecting how people relate to police and how police relate to communities. So we've drawn out this problem space in full, and now we're going to try to address these. So we're looking into the solution space, and we'll start off by looking at some different solutions that have been tried out by law enforcement and by communities to address the same issues that we've been talking about. Go to the next slide. So a main tactic that law enforcement has tried is called community policing. And this is a process of embedding officers in communities for relationship building with civilians uh, rather than just incident response and crisis management. So instead of officers just responding to a call of a domestic violence dispute or shots being fired at such and such location, they show up to a playground they you know, play with kids, chat with parents, they come to a school and talk about their job, and they try to get to know people on a one-to-one -one basis. This was developed out of the theory of, uh, of broken windows, uh, this policing theory that basically says people are suspicious about law enforcement, they won't talk to officers, and crimes will go unreported and continue. But if there's trust built that's genuine, then civilians will feel that they can turn to the police for help. Some officers take this process of community policing really seriously, try to build relationships with families, small business owners, church clergy, school teachers. Um, unfortunately, though, it's sometimes used by police departments only right after there's a big incident in the community, like the publicized killing of an unarmed civilian. And then the department will send in officers as a manner of public relations. And this doesn't really work. Of course, the community sees right through it, no trust is built and it only increases the gap. Um, so uh, there have been, there's been a lot of conversation, especially in the past uh, six months uh, during protests that have gone on this year about changing funding to the police. And what people usually mean by this is allocating an increasing amount of funds to social services, like social workers, mental health professionals, and having these individuals serve on community rounds. And the idea is to decrease the possibility for violence, having responders be unarmed, untrained in methods of violence, and instead trained to manage crises with individuals who are dealing with mental health issues or substance abuse. Um, officers in police departments are sometimes not trained in mental or emotional de-escalation and these sorts of interventions. And, uh, increased social services haven't been tried in large samples, uh, not, and not over large periods of time, so it's harder to talk about their effects. But the pushback on these initiatives usually comes when people think that social workers would entirely replace law enforcement. We can go to the next slide. Then there are these programs that communities themselves have developed in order to support or even obviate the services of law enforcement. So this could include neighborhood watch programs, citizen academy trainings, citizen arrest tactics, anything that engages non-law enforcement members of the community to hold other community members accountable. Um, this can sometimes work in combination with law enforcement. And certain groups have taken this further and built a whole community policing infrastructure. So we won't go into depth about the Black Panthers here, but they 
uh, started by organizing community programs like free breakfasts, free school lunches, after school care programs, supporting the existing education and social services in their communities and building them up stronger. And of course, they also taught self-defense classes involving you know, hand-to-hand -hand combating with weapons to, to build up a sense of community strength. But this was a case where programs were offered not by the police, but in response to the police. Um, you know, for Black people in underserved areas who were victims of rampant police brutality. With all of these community self-policing programs, there are the issues with bias and with reportage. So who's doing the incident management and what biases are they bringing in? Famously, George Zimmerman was part of a neighborhood watch program and that led to the death of a teenager, Trayvon Martin. Um, then the Panthers were brought down by outside forces who felt threatened, but also by infighting and allegiance changes. So social programs can be under assessed and meaning people in them are, aren't vetted. And also the infrastructures for community accountability can be not well set up. So moving on to the next slide. Then there are protest movements. So, uh, you know, we've all been seeing lots of protest movements in, in the past a uh, couple seasons as well. The protest that started after the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor this year um, expanded out and, and galvanized this passionate global movement. The structure of those protests from the Movement for Black Lives really started picking up after killings of Michael Brown and Eric Garner in 2014. So there are connected protest movements that happen over time. Of course, these have roots going back to the civil rights movements too. Um, and we're all familiar generally with how protests work. You know, a critical mass of people marching, chanting slogans, carrying signs. It's important to remember though that protests too are designed and there are specific roles that people play in the organization of them to make them happen. And, you know, the protest itself as a structure can look a lot of different ways. So in the bottom picture here, we see uh, there's a photo from a protest in DC where protesters were laying down for eight minutes, 46 seconds to mourn and memorialize uh, the death of George Floyd. So protest structures can be built in different ways with those basic elements. Next slide. So all of these solutions have their own creativity, but some of the most startling and effective solutions can be ones that break out of the model entirely. So they form a new kind of paradigm. And these solutions might be protest art, they might be performance art, some kind of community emotional release like grieving or a ritual that offers spiritual release. Next slide. Kanupa Hans Galuger is a Native American artist raised in the Standing Rock Reservation with heritage from the Mandan Lakota uh, and the other tribes. Uh, this project of his was produced for people at Standing Rock who are protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline in 2016. And what you see are mirror shields that serve at once to protect the identities of protesters and to reflect back to police their own faces, you know, reflections to make the police reflect. And this really captures the spirit and artistic way of the Gandhian and Kingian nonviolence methods. Next slide. So Luger was inspired, inspired for his mirror shields by protesters in Ukraine at the 2013 Euromaidan protests, uh, which preceded the Ukrainian revolution. So here the protesters are facing off with police and they decide to bring mirrors from their own homes for the same purpose. Go on to the next slide. There have been different kinds of visual art, uh, including people flying banners over, over major cities to do performance pieces like that. These pieces here are the work of Patrice Cullors, who's one of the founding uh, organizers of the Movement for Black Lives and also a performance artist. So we see here you know, a project that brought together mostly women from grieving communities for a guarded communal dance party. And then there's also this on the bottom, a ritual of cleansing for young black people overwhelmed by communal pain and group trauma. So we're showing all these different kinds of possibilities in order to spark uh, 
creativity, but also to emphasize that there's no kind of set format for what works as a, as a design solution to tensions. What's crucial is that it engages people. It engages you individually, if you're involved with it. It engages the community that you're part of. It engages law enforcement. It engages the issues caused by the tensions here. So now that we've primed you a bit to, to design solutions, um, the kind of solutions that we're looking at in the workshops that we're doing could be around behavioral change, like communication methods, interventions, organizational change, like support groups or movement building, expressive practice, like art making or vigil, or contemplative somatic practice, you know, body work, meditation, a spiritual practice. Since we've started holding these workshops, people have started to design powerful solutions that are in communities or wider, from uh, empathy training to VR experiential learning to AI and ML systems to comprehend the media amplification of police civilian interactions. And these are really exciting to see. What we're emphasizing in our workshops is not just creative solutions, um, but the practical application of these. This is where we bring in usability approaches and what Elizabeth was talking about of the human factors of these. Through the lens of usability and the UX design processes, we're going into depth in the group discussions too about how we actually can put these into practice and what kind of issues are gonna come up that might challenge us materially, socially, psychologically, interpersonally, what's going to inhibit our engagement with these solutions and how we can creatively face these challenges. So thinking about these solutions, thank you very much. And I'll pass it back off to Elizabeth. Wow, thank you, Yo and Madebo. I'm I'm a little choked up, I gotta be honest with you, and I've heard this material a lot, but it's really powerful and it's really important. Um, so I just wanna thank the two of you for, uh, you know, working with me on all this because I myself have grown a lot um, and even just listening to this one more time, I have new thoughts. So uh, to the rest of you, we are going to be doing more in the speaker series with World Usability Day. If you go to our website, worldusabilityday.org, you uh, can find out more, you can sign up for our newsletter, and uh, then maybe we can see you at one of our future um, webinars. We'll be doing these throughout 21 and beyond. Uh, world Usability Day is about making the world more usable. And to me, that means safer and more connected um, and technology can certainly help if we use it correctly. So thank you for joining us. And I hope to see you at one of our workshops.